podcast? Like why you do what do you do right now? Well, I'm, as we discussed before, I'm kind of like you. So mm. I'm trying to get my message out mm. to a much larger audience. Right. Uh, as you know, before, uh, when I was in Shanghai, I hosted a lot of events. I ran right. my own meetup groups. Mm -hmm. And you can only reach so many people organically. Exactly. And you can't reach a global audience. So when I moved back to the U.S. last year, I learned about all of these. I'm still learning. Uh, about social media because there's no Facebook, there's no YouTube in China. Mm. Yep. So when I came back, uh, I had to completely change how I think about developing my business, building a following, getting people's attention. And, and yeah, so that's why I'm putting together this podcast and, and having guests like yourself come on the show. And then as you're promoting your business and I'm promoting your business, you're also promoting me. So it's all cross linked together. Yes. And I think most importantly, we were able to connect with each other into in 7 billion people, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's, that's a very cool thing. That's one of all things uh, at Influence we are also are doing. And besides, like last decades, I was trying to really promote culture empathy, mm -hmm. culture intelligence and leadership thing in different countries. And I now realize this. So you want to you want to save that for the interview. <laughs> Okay, sure. I, th I thought it already started. Okay. No. Uh, so, uh, so what's going to happen is I'm going to do a quick introduction. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a quick introduction of you. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, I'm just going to ask the first question. And then mm -hmm. as soon as I ask the first question, uh, everything will be focused on what you want to talk about anyway. So you can just use the question to trigger mm. something that you want to discuss. Absolutely. How many questions overall we have today? There's no, what, what we're doing is mainly, we're, we're going to try to keep the entire interview mm -hmm. uh, at 45 minutes. We don't All right. Too long. Okay. Uh, so there, there isn't a set number of questions. I mean, if you start telling a story, I'm not, I'm not going to cut you off. Okay. And, uh, and, 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 so I'll make this short. <laughs> well, you don't have to make it short. You just, what you want to do is you just want to try to be authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, try to answer the questions not because you're trying to tell people what influence mm. inf influence is mm -hmm. answer the question as this is my story this is my journey For sure. this is why i'm passionate about doing what i do and and that's the reason that we're me and uh, michael toothman are so attracted to you because you are so passionate about this space of cross-cultural mm -hmm. communications, cultural yeah. intelligence, and, and so forth. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so, just, so just relax, be yourself. Yeah. I'll take oh, that. by the way, uh -huh. Josh, you know Josh Steinle? Yeah, it's my alumni uh, brother. He's I don't know. Alumni. Okay. He's <laughs> coming to my house tonight. Oh, wow. Seriously? He, he messaged me this Saturday. Wow. He said okay. he was going home. His home is in Arcadia. Mm -hmm. he, he said he would love to do a podcast with me. So oh, I, I love I love that actually. It's all so, love traction connected. So he's coming on site, and so we're not going to be doing a Zoom call. We're going to be we're on gonna, site. I'm going to figure it out. So that's just interesting. That uh, very exciting. And and just so you know, if you're thinking about doing something like this for your business, yeah. Once you start on this broadcasting journey, where you're broadcasting yourself, it's more mm -hmm. powerful than events. Absolutely. You can, you can reach so many more people this way. And Josh wouldn't be visiting me if I didn't have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a very powerful way to get people really a, a scale their influence and also yeah. to reach a large audience if they have something to say. Absolutely. Okay. So are you ready? I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and start. You can just relax. I'm hmm. going to do a quick introduction, introduction yep. of you, and then I'll just ask you the first question. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, welcome to the China Leadership Dilemma podcast, where once upon a time, I thought I was in the 1% of 1% and I would be able to crush it in China. But lack of awareness and empathy caused me to experience several unexpected disappointments, which we now call CLDs or China Leadership Dilemmas. My guest today is Li Yingying, or in English, Yingying Li. She is a talented young entrepreneur who specializes in cultural intelligence and cross-cultural communications. She has a long list of credentials, so I'm not gonna go over them all now, but 
basically she is from China. She studied at Brigham Young University. And more recently, she's studied at Stanford University. She is the founder of a company called Yingfluence, a cross-cultural leadership training and consulting company based in San Francisco. And more recently, she was named class of 2018, 30 under 30 Chinese entrepreneurs in the US by the All-American Chinese Youth Federation. So uh, welcome Ying Ying to the show. I I'd just like to start with a very simple question. When did you first come to the United States? Well, I came to United States in 2014 for mm -hmm. my second master degree here in BYU, Brigham Young mm -hmm. University. All right, and then how did you transition to Stanford? Well, actually, I'm studying um, after I graduate. Actually, I came here to study a little bit more. Um, and wait, uh, sorry, can, can we just cut this part? Because I'm actually doing our are like a continued study at, at Stanford. That's not okay. actually, I'm doing a degree. Okay. So, sorry about that ex experience because I didn't expect you asked this kind of question. Should oh, we that's all right. Yeah. No, um, no this, is, this is going out. So just- uh, Yeah, just yeah I was on. just doing the continued study since I'm in Silicon Valley and also continue to further improve my entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but shall we okay. restart it? It's, it's fine. Yeah. So yeah, don't worry about it. This is uh, people like you when you're authentic. And yeah. um, so one of the things that was really impressive mm -hmm. about you is this 30 for 30. I, it's, okay. it's actually a very prestigious to be named. Uh, you're, that means you're under 30 years old. Um, I am <laughs> At this point, almost reaching 30, <laughs> almost reaching 30. And, and you've been recognized as one of the really bright and talented Chinese entrepreneurs in the US because of your business influence. So for, for our larger audience who may not know mm -hmm. about this award, can you talk a little bit more about, uh, did somebody nominate you for this award? How, how, did, how did you come about getting this award? Oh, first of all, I believe there are enough walls in today's world, but there's never enough bridges Mm -hmm. So bridges between cultures that creates peace, right? Bridges mm -hmm. between companies create prosperity and mm -hmm. bridges between people create empathy and new opportunities. I think the original idea why we start this is because this is something we truly care. And I, going back to your question that why I, I reflect on this, why I was able to get selected at 30 under 30 into mm -hmm. today's, especially this year. I was yeah. thinking probably this is what the world needs at this particular moment. And we are living in a world that in some way brings a lot of anxiety to people and people, different cultures, backgrounds because of this societal changes. And I think for understanding people from different culture and that will in some way help us all understand what life is about so i think this business started from that single idea and belief that we want to create more bridges and i think that's one of the reasons why we get noticed by this organization in la and they're okay. very 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 um, dedicate, very much dedicated in truly helping entrepreneurs in, in the United States to... So, th so they prosper. discovered you. It wasn't like somebody nominated you. They well, actually, you. in some way, it's an application process. They oh. actually, um, they, in some way, I, I believe three months ago, or four months ago, in the beginning of the year, started to, to um, send out to this, this news that they encourage uh, entrepreneurs from all the United States to apply for this award. This, in the beginning, and I believe they select 900 or 900 mm -hmm. applications, send mm -hmm. this to them. And uh, among 900 entrepreneurs of startups in the whole United States, they select the 30, I believe what best matches what their goal and their spirit. So, very honored to be selected. In, yeah. Do in you know way. how many? Do you know how many years they have been doing this award? 
30 under 30 Chinese entrepreneurs? Well, actually, this is the second year. Last year was the first year, but this organization has been there for quite a while, as you already did some research, if you yeah. say. And I think in some way, it's really matching what the error calls for. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, very excited, actually, as well as to, um, I'm very excited and passionate in dedicating what I can do to this journey with mm -hmm. the committee, as well as other entrepreneurs here in the States, mm -hmm. really to make the spirit last. Yes. Okay. So normally I might ask you how you came up with the name, your business name, but the influence is pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Yang is part of your name and you want to influence others probably in this kind of cross. Yeah, and that's in some way self-explanatory, but there's yeah. more. Again, I put a sticker in my cell phone to remind me almost every single day. So what this logo and this influence tells, so now people come to me. Also, Ying Ying, tell me what, what is the influence? What is the influence about? So I will let them look at my cell phone, the sticker, and also the name. So tell me what's in first English name come to your mind when you saw or hear influence. Oh, influence, obviously, Yin Xiang Li in Chinese, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll say, okay, so what are the personal and professional, um, you know, what in, in life personally and professionally you're using your influence to, mm -hmm. to really to create a better world? you know, mm -hmm. for your business, for your family mm -hmm. and people around you. I think it's self-explanatory. Right. What we are doing right now here in marketing, in business, in negotiating, in branding, in thought leadership, create, increasing the awareness of uh, creating a better, you, you know, better community for people yeah. to really get things, you know, get things done and bring people together. And yeah, in so that way, and most importantly here, I want to say a little bit more, it's about, not about helping people to, to teach them how to influence. The mm. most important thing is teach people to understand how not to be influenced in the way they don't want to be influenced. And mm. I think in today's world, we all know what happens with technology and what's with, happened with media. And the mm. media environment for the last decades has changed tremendously cross-culturally. And I think most people, underestimate the power of the influence in helping them to make decisions and mm -hmm. connecting with people, you yeah. know, in, in creating a better environment. I would say that we all know what apps does, right? What those apps can do. And so a lot of things right now in today's world are trying to manipulate and monetize our attention. I, I really, really, really hope that by, by, empowering more people to understand what's going on with this you know cross-cultural social media environment as well as this this geopolitical situation sometimes we understand really it is super important to take our intellectual level to the next stage which is to grow more awareness empathy and build more bridges instead of walls yeah. So, I mean, what you do is, uh, you know, has a lot of similarities to what I do. I, I also want to talk about, um, you know, you coming up with the idea of the business and your byline for influence is empower your cross-cultural leadership. So mm -hmm. can you explain a little bit why the word leadership is in there? In today's world, leadership, first of all, means self-leading. If you cannot do very well within yourself, if you have never taken a journey to your inside of yourself to find out who you stand for, what is your culture identity and how you can build relationship or what is relationship for you with other people from different cultural backgrounds and from your organization, from your country, outside of your country, I would say that that's, that's, that's something important to really think about first. And, okay. which means and how does that tie into, I also read that it also ties into something that you like to teach is called diversity thinking. Yes. How does that tie into cross-cultural leadership, the importance of diversity thinking? I believe that's self-explanatory. Right now, we are living a more and more diverse cultural background. Okay. And diversity 
it's more than just race and gender. For mm. example, in Silicon Valley, most people talk about diversity and inclusion in corporate right. setting, how we can encourage that. But diversity means much, much more than that. It mm. means the richness of cultures. Right. In some way, and one particular example is I grew up in central China, a city called mm. Kaifeng, 2,700 mm. years old. Mm. It used to be the capital city of the Northern Song Dynasty. Mm. And the people there, it, it's literally the cradle of Chinese civilization. So when I grew up, the people are, well, what we understand there is very traditional Chinese culture and mindset. Mm. So at that time, when I grew up, there's absolutely no sense of what diversity really means because people do encourage you to fit in the culture. You know, a centralization of authorities are there all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you turn to be a little uh, different personality or like to be able to speaking up, right. well, sometimes, you know, in China, the, um, the duck makes the most noise, gets shot and the, and stick out, the nail stick out, it will get beaten, this kind of thing. So when I grow up, I know that it's, it's very important to understand their different values and cultures. Right. Right. Since mm -hmm. I, was, I was really given this opportunity to go to Hubei University to take this first in international cross-cultural communication major back then. And also that leads to my journey to India, Turkey, um, Brazil, even in the United States, the first stop is Utah. Utah mm -hmm. is very famous for its uh, Mormon, Mormon culture. Right. All very religious, very diverse, very cultural. So right. that experience vastly expands what I understand about the world. Think about a, a Chinese girl from the most traditional place and most ancient place even in central China. So and there's to which extent she could understand what diversity means in her life if she was not given these opportunities to go to the places with the most diversity, the, the diverse culture background, and they were sometimes religious. So mm -hmm. I truly understand that it's at the end of the day, for example, after living in, in, in the Hinduist culture, Muslim culture, and the Catholic culture, and I went to, I went to Utah. I study in BYU, it's a Mormon school. So among 30,000 students, there is probably 98.7% are the church members, all right, mm -hmm. at that particular moment. And I got a little bit of culture shock after living in those kind of places. I say, oh, Ying Ying, you're fine. You're living in India, Turkey, and Brazil. You own a people very religious, it's fine. But in some way, at that particular moment, I realized, yeah, it's a very unique culture background for me. Are you still, um, you know, your, your, that story is so interesting. You think <laughs> you came from the most traditional uh -huh. part of China. Yes. I actually, often when I do my keynote speeches, I always say my wife came uh -huh. from a very traditional part of China. She wow. came from a fourth tier province uh, in Hunan. Mm -hmm. so, as you know, Hunan is where Chairman Mao Zedong Mao, exactly. came from. Exactly. So if you walk into the fa their family room of, mm -hmm. of their family house, you can still see Mao's portrait yeah. on the wall. Yes. That's how traditional it is. And my wife came over to the US, you know, like, um, well, it's gotta be 10 years ago now. I, mm -hmm. I can't even date right, but she came over to do postdoctoral research. She works for a multinational company and she still struggles now with the cultural differences between the environment in which she was raised yeah. and America. So the reason I, I said that is I, I'm just curious because I mean, your English is so good and, and you're successful as an entrepreneur and doing what you're doing. Do you still struggle with any value or cultural differences here in America? I will say as long as I came from a, a different cultural background, I grew up in a different cultural background. I would say it's super natural to understand that when you encounter a very new or different culture, that as a human, substantially speaking, as a human being, you know, you will feel in some way 
you're out of your comfort zone. You know, if not fear, you have something. Wow, this is different. And because you get out of your comfort zone, I would say that you like subconsciously or instantly you will have some feeling like that. But I think understanding that feeling is so important. Because what about for you personally? My personally. Um, yeah, have you? Because you're dealing with so your background is from a very traditional part of China. Yeah. But here in San Francisco in the U.S., mm -hmm. you're always working with and even your clients. They're mm -hmm. different multinational cultures. companies. Your clients aren't Chinese people. Your clients mm -hmm. are non-Chinese. Yes. And even your partners are non-Chinese. So, um, do I'll they do ever kind of cause you frustration because? They don't see well, I see your point. Yeah, thanks for asking this question. It's a great question. I would say I turn to handle it better than I expected most of the time because I really leave the kind of different cultures. So before interacting with person or this group, so what I put is I kind of like the face changing. You know, in China, there's all ancient art. If face changing, you shift that, enter your mental zone that you think you're equal with them. You're not that different. You're not from the, the, the remote area from China or some traditional places. You shift your minds a little bit. You think you can talk to them, engage with them equally by really using the, what they know sometimes to tell and share what they don't know. And, and I think that's, that's truly, truly important because if you use, for example, Language plays such an important role in cross-cultural communication and building bridges. If I do not speak English, if I do not speak the English like with American accent sometimes, well, it's, it's really very obvious that this, you know, a misunderstanding or sometimes it's hard for the trust to build immediately. The yeah. same applies to if American right now I meet in Silicon Valley. If I, in the first five seconds, identify that he speak Chinese very well, and also understanding Chinese law, the history, wow, wow. Even for the five seconds, I immediately develop a sort of interest, curiosity, and even this compassion in knowing this person more. I would say this, everybody, that's why I go back to my cross-cultural leadership thing. I always think, focus on yourself, focus on individual, your inner leadership development. Mm. Right, develop your empathy, and you always mention empathy and awareness, but it's so important. Yeah, I want to dig a little bit deeper on you mentioned something about the face. face. So, and in, in, in people who've studied Chinese business culture, they know that mm -hmm. giving and receiving face is very important in Chinese culture. In, in Chinese, we call it mian. Uh, and what I've discovered with a lot of Chinese people that I work with mm -hmm. is. Um, while we as foreigners need to understand the concept of face dealing with Chinese people, mm -hmm. my question is for you as a Chinese people, when foreigners or Americans mm -hmm. inadvertently mm -hmm. don't give you face, mm. because Chinese sometimes, or non-Chinese, they sometimes, they, they're just direct and they just mm. give their opinion. Right. And, and in Chinese culture, it means you're not giving face. Mm. How do you Naturally, when you're not giving face, when you feel disrespected, there has to be a negative emotion because that's the environment in which you were raised. Are you aware of it and how do you control it and how do you manage it? Because my wife, she struggles with that. Okay. So that's... I have to explain to her that Americans don't have the same context. Mm. When they don't give you respect. It's just part of the American culture. I see. Very, very good question. I've been given this kind of question a lot, but I do think it's typical to answer. So how we, how we react when, you know, Not something. We. How do you? I okay. Want to understand, I want to understand your personal experience. My personal you know, experience. I will see. People not giving you face. There is a book called Leading with Culture Difference, a culture intelligence, leading with cultural intelligence by Dave, David Livmore. So in his book or theory, he described the four pillars about cultural intelligence. The first is CQ drive, second is CQ knowledge, third CQ strategy and CQ action. So I believe what we just mentioned about here is a CQ 
knowledge, which is, do if I engage with American, if I engage with Chinese, no matter here in the United States or in China, do I understand overarchingly, okay, the basic or most distinguished differences between these two cultures when we engage in a business setting, professional setting, personal setting, I think essentially the face is a, it's, it's typical culture concept in, in China. Yeah, right? but I'm, I'm interested in your face. Um, I wouldn't really, I would say not so many, like um, my non-Chinese friend haven't gave me face yet. I, I really think that it's not, not really important to me. I, was, I would honestly think it's more important for me to open my curiosity, open my mm -hmm. mind to receive criticism because my essential goal as a human being, no matter which cultural background I'm from, no matter in the future I become a global citizen or not. And I feel like my goal is to grow intellectually, you know, culturally, and mm -hmm. many, many, in many, many ways. If that is your goal, okay, it's goal-oriented, solution-oriented. Mm -hmm. And if you care too much about what's going on and how to take you there, I mean, the goal is, as long as this is for your, if, if it's good for you to really, to be able to improve self, improve yourself, and improve mm -hmm. the whole organization, and why not? It's a fabulous opportunity for me. So my business partner, he is what you just described. He's typical American. He many times in our meeting, in our talk, because I still, I still in some way, you know, is engaging with some Chinese culture background. Sometimes I was, I tend to be a little indirect to him when sharing my opinions. So he, end up just face to face, eye to eye, and uh, not pushing me in the corner, but sometimes give you a very direct question, Ying Ying, I believe this is what we need to do. Let me show you, okay? He make Excel or format of things. This is why we need to do so. If we do not do so, the result or the risk would be blah, blah, blah. And then I immediately cool down myself because sometimes I go out, I meet my audience, oh, your class is good. I like, I really like your spirit and keep going. But I think once this happens to me, I was able to cool down myself because I know that I can go much bigger and better. No, that's great. Because it's natural. It's, it's natural, natural to, well, because, you know, I'm also in a lot of, you know, I've dealt with a lot of cross-cultural business partners. I'm sure, yeah. I'm in a cross-cultural marriage. Oh. So, and, and, and you just used the phrase, I had to cool down. Mm -hmm. So what that means is, number one, is some value difference or different way of looking at a business problem mm -hmm. was frustrating to you because he didn't seem to see your point of view. And then you had to kind of take a step back and understand why he was saying the things that he said. And, and also thinking. one particular concept from neuroscience, I believe is called the mirror neurons. And mm. I think that plays a huge role in communication. And when I teach sometimes, and I feel like it's super important to, to really share your passion, you know, visually, mm. physically, facially sometimes, and share your compassion, share your trust. Like you talk to your partner, maybe someone talk to their clients mm. in the first place because you guys have a very different cultural background. Right. If, you, if you can really make, you know, in the first place, make him or her think, wow, we're not we're really focused on only one goal or win-win situation here, no matter we're talking about a deal or we are talking about changing someone's behavior. Mm. So I would say that the win-win situations, like we, after this talk, engagement, our goal is only one. It's not like I, I dominate or conquer you. It's, it's not about like, oh, I have to persuade you. I convince you. No. And the whole point after this engagement, communication, or engage, sort of any kind of engagement workshop is really to get you there because that's what I care and that's what you care. We won't see you there. You craft a scenario for them. 
you know, it's like show them what success already looks like. Right. And be positive. And the way you describe it, the way you really bring this out will already mean it mm. to this, this audience. So I really mm. think that's about you, that's whole process putting it together. Yeah, Never. so let, let, let me, uh, I think this is so great that you, the reason that you can actually build a business about this is because you're so passionate about, <laughs> about these topics, which is great. Um, so because you're in the Silicon Valley area, you work with a lot of companies like LinkedIn and Facebook. Does Yingfluence work with any Chinese clients? Chinese clients, we do actually, and not just Chinese, a lot of from Asia. We mm -hmm. also work some founders from Asia, from, uh, let's say, from Hong Kong and from Korea, and okay. also a few of them actually from China. So we deal with people not just from the training coaching perspective, mm -hmm. we including them actually helping to, to turn their brands to be a sort of a lot thought leadership that I can really engage with a culture in, in, in the United States or, you know, in Brazil and in China. Okay, so I, I want to just compare mm -hmm. when you're talking to a multinational American company like a Facebook or LinkedIn, mm -hmm. and when you're talking for a prospective client mm -hmm. that's from a Chinese company, so mm -hmm. Chinese decision maker, he's, he or she is getting ready to enter mm -hmm. the United States, they need university training. How is your approach different when you, other than you might speak Chinese to the Chinese person, but strategically, how do you approach convincing your value proposition mm -hmm. to Chinese and to an American company? Just take those two. How do you, yes. what's the difference in the way that you articulate your value proposition? Great, I love this question. This is where and when cultural intelligence come into picture. And I wouldn't, when I say so, it has to really, really be future oriented. When I talk about cultural intelligence, I was, I would take myself an example for American companies or Westerner partners or stakeholders, the way we have to do it to gain respect first, which is not to behave too much like a Chinese Chinese. I think the most important thing is you already learn the culture. You already know the, the behavior. You already know the laws and regulation has to be followed. If you act like some, someone does not care about the laws regulation, mm -hmm. you're definitely in trouble. You, you put the future much, you know, future is what we blo block most of what we hear, what we engage. You put this wall way, way high, tall, mm -hmm. and there's no way for you to build bridges and connect with people. I would say you show your respect, your understanding, your culture knowledge, your culture strategy with them. Letting this person know, wow, I know you she knows so much about our culture and our way of engagement and let's let's talk more so she treat you they treat you a little bit different in the beginning so, so your approach with chinese uh -huh, clients same way. And US, is, it, is identical i would say the overarching theory or framework is the same when i approach the chinese people well let's say some of my clients coming from china they are from let's say some are government officials some are you know working in big enterprise from national enterprise some are just entrepreneurs and some are just you know those media person i would say a lot of times when a chinese clients coming to the silicon valley we welcome them in a way it generally setting generally speaking i am engaged though, with a group of people when they come here i'm probably the only chinese face uh, into you know in this setting in meeting or engagement and they naturally find you know i also talk the languages they, they talk they speak mm -hmm. for example if i find they speak some dialects from my hometown like henan province i immediately you know i will not just be all formally like oh let's speak english you have to come here speak english or even formal mandarin i'm going to use my dialect I even can drink with you together if you, you want me to, you know, some way come here, you know, after this meeting, let's go take a drink. I will drink with you. So in some way, I immediately speak my dialect sometimes. It's, it's very, that really, really effective. When I speak Mandarin, I speak Mandarin like this. I, Li Zong, ni hao. Ru, if I speak my dialect, I become like a person much closer to this person. If I found it's from 
Dongbei, <laughs> the mm. Northeast China. I will speak some dialects and funny terms, make things out, you know, just like make humor is one of the best lubricant in yeah. the communication. And I can use the dialect with such a culture understanding in the specific area that they are mm. from. Mm. You know, that's, that's makes so much difference. Mm. And most of the time I use that and it really work. And then we start to talk next because I respect where they come from. And then we can talk about business sometimes. Yeah, I, I, you mentioned something that I want to dig a little bit deeper on. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I'm, when I'm in a class or in a keynote, I always need the audience to know that, that China or when people think of China or when people think of Chinese, it's, mm. they're not one homogeneous kind of group. I mean, mm. there are people from mainland China, there are right. overseas Chinese, even within China, there's like 57 different provinces. They all have a different language, different food, different dialect. I want to understand because there's a lot of stereotypes. There's cultural stereotypes. Mm -hmm. There's stereotypes that Foreigners or Americans have Chinese people. Some mm -hmm. of them may call it, cause cultural mm -hmm. biases. Mm -hmm. And then there are stereotypes that Chinese people have of Chinese people. Mm. I want to understand what you mean by Chinese Chinese. Chinese Chinese, like people from my hometown, I'm a, I was a Chinese Chinese. <laughs> what, what does that actually mean? So, was anybody coming from China is Chinese Chinese? Is my wife Chinese Chinese? I do not know her too much, but I would say that in my case would be typically embrace a lot of the Chinese traditional traditional values and culture, you know, what we call the, you know, Confucianism, and we learn wow. about how to, you know, I mean, Chinese can, in some way, their typical Chinese culture and values that is are different, they are different with American or Western ones. So as you know that we are collectives, we focus on harmony, centralization mm -hmm. of authorities norm. And right. also we also focus on efficiency and China speed. And we like making things like, we like making big products, you know, big comprehensive projects. We can get from Great Wall and to high speed train built, you know, in this tremendous way. And Chinese, I mean, a lot of things are in some way like when I was in Brazil, Brazilian people I naturally love going to the beach and dance samba and drinking beers, feel very happy go lucky. So right. work goes second, secondary right. sometimes. So right. so in that way, you if you understand that as a Chinese company going to this going to these areas like São Paulo, you know of course you can't complain and those the, what Jess just said like. The, Brazilian couldn't get things done. You should mm. respect them first, understanding why they do what they do, right? Mm. So, yeah, when you talk about Chinese, Chinese, or just Chinese culture, so it, since you came from mainland China, you, writ, you wrote an article once on about why LinkedIn is successful in China, and perhaps, uh, and you related it to their use of guanxi. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, Facebook is not in China yet, but I know Mark Zuckerberg is doing all he can to develop the guanxi. Mm. He's learning Mandarin Chinese. Um, can you kind of help our American audience mm. understand what is the difference between what Chinese people view as guanxi mm. and what Americans view as just developing good relationships? Mm. I will see, first of all, guanxi as a term, as a culture term, has been developed or explained or expanded in many, many ways by the Western scholars. While I was doing this research, I studied a lot of uh, scholars' uh, article th thesis about their understanding and tradition about this. What I see that I think it's essentially grew up in a culture that is guanxi is definitely one of the most important uh, factors in our social relationship and uh, you know in our growth. I would say. How is it different? How is it different than what Americans think about just developing good relationships? Is there what's the difference? I would say, in today's world, China significantly is significantly different than previous years right now. China is more open. So the guanxi mm -hmm. in different regions of China has also have different meanings. I always right. say that in maybe 
China, you just mentioned, they have four or five different tiers of cities. Right. And I would say for modern, young modern professionals, mm -hmm. Guanxi is obviously still existing, very important in building relationships. But it's more than that. I would say that in kingshi culture, we definitely think that building a harmonious culture will foster productivity, efficiency in a country with a huge focus in this efficiency culture, or you know, like, for example, elevating, you know, reducing poverty, you know, and moving Chinese, uh, the whole nation to the mm -hmm. next stage. Mm -hmm. I think in some way, Guanxi is not just in a personal level, and it's in a national level, in a cultural, in higher, higher level of cultural, you know, umbrella. Mm. So I was in that way, culture meaning, you know, Guanxi's culture meaning in China is much more rich than what people generally write a post, an article about, and especially shared in Western medias. I would say mm -hmm. that. So if you have American clients who are going to China and mm -hmm. they're going there, let's say they're going there as expats where they're mm. leading local, a local team there. Yeah. What, what advice do you give them about how to develop successful Guanxi relationships in China? I would say it's a team. Who is this person? Is this person a high level executives sent by American company? Yes. Like I would say, I will wholly focus on this person who was assigned this international assignment or task going mm -hmm. to China. Again, in our training programs, we say like step by step, there are CQ, there are four pillars. And also when you go to China, you need to realize it's your personal and professional interests in developing Guanxi. It's not like if you going to China with the thinking that I'm coming, I came to China only for my company's success. Mm. That wouldn't really help you because you're in some way passively receiving this task. You were, you know, as a human being, we want to naturally embrace something and base our natural interests. So in the first place, ask yourself before you even embark on this journey, do you have genuine interest in Chinese culture, in Chinese history, in what makes China, China now, in Chinese people? So ask about that first, then ask, like, in, in, when I go into China, like how much time I commit for my personal develop, interest in developing, understanding the relationship and how much time I develop, I use for my business and the professional development. So, so for the American executive, mm -hmm. for, for this person, he's been assigned or he or she has been assigned to go mm -hmm. to China. Mm -hmm. And you're giving this particular person advice and you can, he actually doesn't, he's going there for the money, for the expat assignment, yeah. uh, but he really doesn't have that much interest in learning and studying Chinese language and Chinese culture because yeah. the company is going to arrange a translator and an assistant yeah. Yeah. and a secretary and a driver. What advice do you give that person as far as developing Guanxi in China? find someone who can inspire you, who can tremendously lead you to the tremendous success. If you are not open to this particular light, what I call light, mm -hmm. what is it? light could be a person like you and like me. Light could be a group, you know, a, a company. You go there for some leading methodology in, in or like some consultancy help, or mm -hmm. light could be engaging or understanding Chinese millennials and social media, those kind of thing. You know, right now, media information data comes from all different channels around us. Mm -hmm. It's vastly easy for you to get, if you don't have a curiosity, you need someone to give you a little bit trigger to, to open that curiosity pool. And you can do that. Sometimes it could be just download WeChat. 
just downloading WeChat, downloading those interesting apps and oh, find out that's quite interesting. The way they communicate, engage and post things are different with us. If you just completely block yourself, okay, that's not relevant to me. Why, why bother to take this action initiatives? Well, you just uh, give yourself a difficulty. You know, you just give yourself a, um, you know, it's really about self-motivation and also how open and curious, curious you are about this, this particular. Now, the majority of American clients that you work with or speak mm -hmm. with or, or they're in your audience when you're doing a lecture or a talk, uh, what is your sense? Do, do the majority of them care to do the things that you recommend or what, what is your sense? That goes to my CQ 2.0 theory or culture intelligence 2.0. Well, I respect the previous scholars did a lot of research on how we could be globally culturally intelligent, how we could really become more efficient in our international assignment, a global connection. That was um, in some way, a lot of research they haven't really tapped into the last few years what social media digitalization did for us, for human being, not just the, for the Western world, but also for China. Also, mainly, this is all driven by technology. And I think, and who are mostly on those digitalization world? Millennials, or even younger, you know, the, you know, the Generation Z, those younger generations that even decades younger than me. I would say that that's a culture worth noticing. That's the future by, by 2050. And you know, the world, a half of the world population is under 30 years old, 2025 mm -hmm. or 2050. It's very quickly, it's gonna be like that. So if you don't embrace that, mm -hmm. and most importantly embrace, this is taking your cultural intelligence to the next level to think about how you communicate and connect with people from different cultures most efficiently by understanding the culture difference, not just culture difference, the digital culture intelligence, build your cult digital culture intelligence, understand the geopolitical situation, understand international relations, understand rules, regulations a little bit more deeper by genuinely having the interest in understanding this culture and society. Not just a, hey, I read this article from this particular media and post. I developed such resistant, resistance that I think I do not want to engage with particular society and culture. It's frustrating. I think if you think you're frustrating, you notice you have this frustration, you're already blocking yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not even giving yourself a chance. Right. I think the important thing is to realize this feeling and then see, wow, my goal, I'm not trying to stay there to build this hatred or building this, you know, this frustration, upset. I'm going to do something about it. If not for my organization, if I don't have motivation to go to different country, start a business, at least right now, I can build something inside of myself that I can eventually build more empathy, build more awareness, build more understanding. You know, like by engaging with that group of people from that particular social media environment. Mm -hmm. I also use my talk as example. That's what I call, you, you can build your global intelligence network. How to do that? Imagine you're, let's say success, you're a business woman or man. You like traveling, you travel a lot. And also you like connecting with people. You go to all the different business meetings like in Harvard, in, you know, in Sao Paulo, in Dubai, for blockchain, for AI. Okay, so find those people, identify the people who you can be friends with, no matter how short is your stay, for half a day, three days, a month, okay? Do not be indifferent and connect with them on social media. And you know that you can connect with them all the time. And then when you come back, no matter you're living in a small town or in San Francisco, anywhere, you can and you will be able to connect with them to see what they produce. And of course, the first thing is you understand those people who you connect with are trustworthy. So you, in some way, turn to believe what they share in some way can shape your decision making. Mm -hmm. And then little by little, you can engage with them. You can have further collaboration. 
like my friend in Brazil still share a lot of live, you know, post about Brazil, not just about the local news and their daily life. I noticed some risk as well as some opportunities from their post. And right. I think that's the friend circle, the global intelligence network you build whenever you travel with this culture intelligence 2.0, you can make that work for you tremendously and then build, expand your network. And the people generally you connect with, little by little will also influenced by you because you keep sharing your valuable things. If they find that's valuable, not, uh, valuable opportunities, values, insightful things can connect with them. They come right. back, to engage with you more. That actually is, you build an ecosystem for you that help yeah. you little by little get off, you know, build a special place. Yeah. So it, part of helping, so part of helping people yeah. be successful is also helping them to adjust their mindset. Yeah, yes. That will help you, you know, like daily live in a world that you feel there, there's full of hope. There's full of people who are empathetic. There's full right. of people who are smart, intelligent, impactful. They want to make great things happen instead of creating this conflict. Right. So we have a few more minutes before we wrap this interview up. Now we want to we wanna shift gears. You've been giving our audience a lot of information about cultural intelligence and advice if you're going on a foreign assignment, we want to shift this focus back to you now. Uh, we want to talk about your influencers. Um, you wrote an article about, uh, about meeting Melinda Gates. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about uh, meeting somebody like her. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if she's one of your influencers or not, but <laughs> then talk about people who influence you. So okay. I know that you're trying to help train and teach a mm -hmm. lot of different people in this cross-cultural world to help the world be more harmonious. But now let's talk about where do you get your knowledge and inspiration from besides reading books? I'm talking about Definitely, people. definitely. I would say, speaking of this trip to Melinda Gates' office and having this precious interview with her was given, this opportunity was given by Taishi Media Group while I was working for them um, mm -hmm. in 2016, the beginning of the year, we were sent, selected to be the two, uh, one, um, me and my colleague, we were going to visit Bill Gates Foundation and as well as meet, meeting and speaking with her about Warren Buffett's annual letter for that mm -hmm. particular year. So it's assignment to really be able to ask a few good questions and also to, to help uh, Melinda Gates or to help the Gates Foundation to share the message better with Chinese audience. We were the only, the first, the only media that's from China was selected to mm -hmm. have this opportunity. I think it's tremendous honor. Well, I learned something hugely influenced me after you know, this trip back. I would say just this assignment, I need to do research. I watched TED Talk from, Melinda Gates, I study about what her initiative and passion come from or are going to. So truly inspired by one big particular thing among many other things is her communication and leadership, which means she is very, very much articulative. And I think it's important to speak up I think and if you watch the, the video, I watched many, many times. So being a, such a great communicator is already a leader over there to make people want to follow you. And if you have something to say, most important, if you have some the power, if you have the impact, influence, you have the money, not just money, the power, the influence, the positive impact. And why don't you? Why don't you to develop, to, to, to devote that power of communication leadership to mm. making great things happen? So I'm, I'm hugely um, attracted by this kind of initiative. And, and I think this, after this visit to Gates Foundation, I feel like the world needs more people like Gates. And the, going back to your uh, question about who else inspired me a lot, I would say, um, I would say, many thought leaders that I met in my life, but two particular thought leaders I would recommend people to follow and mm -hmm. online. One is Jason Silva. Jason Silva, he, he, he was the TV host of Brain Game. 
And he is also the producer of uh, The Shots of Awe. He is literally the futurist and the media person and philosopher and also great communicator, a thought leader. What, what the reason why I say so, I watched his video, I met him in person in San Francisco, had a talk with him as well. The way, I never seen such a good communicator. He, he, he's from, originally from Venezuela. His mother language is Spanish, but English using the words to connect and engage with people, to bring out this emotion, to foster a movement, a drive. That's particularly ex exciting to me. One thing he mentioned in his talk, I keep watching many times about the new concept of billionaire. What is a billionaire in today's world right now? Does a billionaire make a billion dollars? Not necessarily. A billionaire right now is someone who can use a positive influence to influence a billion people. So that can change the billion people's life, possibly. And that, I think that's something triggered me along the way, among many other things. And he, the way he talks, I think words are powerful. If you really truly understand that, that it focus on being better and better communicators, you're already a cross-cultural leader. So, so how, does he, how does he influence people? Does he have a- Produce a lot of videos lot of and videos. content, speak to a lot of audience. Mm -hmm. It sounds that deep. So maybe I'm not saying that his words connect with a, you know, 7 billion people. I would say that that's what human needs. So mm. essentially, it's not just being inspired to find a lot of hope and treat, you know, find intelligence from his words. And Have I think you I find a lot of intelligence from his words. I want, yeah, I learned a lot. And, and that's one of, he's one of the leaders that inspired me. And there are many others, the Simon Sinek. You said, you said there was two. Oh, Simon yeah. Sinek. Simon Sinek. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I, I like his talk, start with the why, and also leaders eat last. These mm. talks, you know, we need more visionary and so leaders so are so good at articulating. Mm. And, 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 le and really articulating and motivating people, not for the sake of for themselves, not mm. for the bad. There's so many people in social media are leading because they in some way want to be, you know, they want to be liked. Or I think every leader, every potential influencer, influencers, the influencer, they should ask themselves before they start, is this truly about me? Is, or... I leave for the rest of the people that I can engage with. Mm. You know, I always think that I don't, I'm not religious, but I talk to the divine power. I told, I communicate frequently. I said, if it's really the God's quote unquote intention or blessing for me from, you know, a young Chinese girl from a traditional Chinese town, very small place, to be able to get out and have this cultural experience from very different places and meet very different people. And why not dream bigger, do bigger? I can't, I can't live a life just for myself right now. I can't, I can't think about, you know, I can't get satisfied just by thinking about, well, I can get a job, international job, you know, travel and having pleasure. You know, even seeing sceneries cannot satisfy me. When I was in Brazil, you know, I, and Brazil is so beautiful. When I was traveling, well, you know, many times, suddenly I had one particular feeling very strong. Well, I traveled back on the bus. That was several years ago. I had a feeling, I look outside beautiful scenery. Yeah, the world is beautiful. But if you just travel for yourself, for fun, for pleasure, even for your family, it will be too less satisfied that then that I can inspire and engage, empower more people who are able to use the power, you know, use the power of communication, use the power of cultural intelligence to do great things. The world right now is shifting so quickly. People are living in a world full of anxieties. And in this particular moment is more important than ever for every one of us to be a little bit more, a little bit more mission-driven, a little bit more altruism 
you know, altruistic for other people. Or maybe more think not just for yourself, your cultural identity, your nation. Think about human race. Mm. Think about human race as a whole. If you can't do that, I will help them. You know, people like us can help them. How to do that using our talents of communication. I always say the example, think you are astronaut. You are off from the earth right now. You're looking the whole earth as a whole bowl. Seven billion people are struggling or living the life. They won't get better and better. So you will not think, well, you're from the United States. Oh, you're from China. Oh, let's fight. Oh, let's like do something like, oh, who is right? So tr really it's important to think about in that level. So then human being can move to the next stage. And with AI right now, is accelerating. With artificial intelligence, no one really knows what human being, what challenges what we're really facing. Wow, so we, we can really see that you're, you're doing what you're doing, not just because you wanna create a business, but you're so passionate about hopefully eventually changing the world with your influence or with if I can do, I think everybody asks this question, how yeah. can you change the world? Or everybody say to themselves, I won't change the world. I think the fundamental question here is what best of you can contribute to this mission that you can change the world? What is your expertise? What is your strength? And focus on the particular strength you have. Yeah. And I think right? this, Yep, and I think uh, Influence really is the platform that you've developed to do exactly what you want to do, which I yeah. think is great. I would say that last in, in important thing is we have a belief system here. I think we have this belief system embraced by Asians, and Africans, Americans, immigrants alike, and even billionaires, the students, millennials, and even the executives, and women and men. I would say like we need to build more bridges. Right. And that's how we do what we do. So besides, besides doing like coaching, communicate, this is a very basic way we can share our message. We want to essentially build the community. This influence community, what I say, I want to be able to provide access to this content research method, inspiring leaders who come in and can really share the great beliefs and participate and using the power of digitalization in today's yes. ever globalized world. I think that's truly what we want to do at this point. Yeah, so if we could use one phrase to describe your mission, it's really just building bridges. Yes. Okay, that's, that's awesome. So I wanna thank you for spending this time with us. You've taught our audience so much about cultural intelligence and cross-cultural communications. Thank you. Sharing your story and uh, yeah, any, any last words for, so our audience, uh, the focus is Americans. So I know the world is large and there's many different <laughs> cultures all over the place, but yeah. the focus of this podcast is really American expats in China. Hmm. So because of your background coming from China, hmm. being an entrepreneur and a thought leader here in the U.S., uh, any kind of words of wisdom or, or, or advice for Americans who are getting ready to go to China, other than build bridges? <laughs> I would say, focus on your power in being a world-class communicator and true cross-cultural leaders that bring the most empathy as well as opportunities from waiting you. Okay. Wow. Very, okay. Very well said. Thank you very much. We're going to end the show now. So just wave goodbye to our audience because this is going to be on video too. Thank you so much, Jean. Very Bye. happy to talk you here. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's it. Oh, We're done. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. <laughs> You yeah. did great. Um, you know, sometimes you have a audience where uh, you're interviewing somebody and, and they're very mechanical, which means you yeah. ask a question, they give you an answer and they don't elaborate. So that's great that you just follow your passion and, and just 
take the question and just talk about whatever you want. And, and, yeah, I didn't really have any thoughts in my mind before this because, and I was busy with other things, but I do love the questions. You're a very, very good interviewer. I think you did a lot in making this great thing happen. And I can see you tremendous, you know, I can see you from the beginning. I know you until now. You make tremendous progress right now. Look what you have here. You, you have professional things, setting, very active. Yeah, well, we're just, uh, we're, I think we're both in the same boat. We're just trying to find our mark and put it on the world. Yeah, I would say this is really, really tapping into the power of social media, no matter what other people are saying right now. I think I also have a theory I didn't share, which is if there's so many negative voice or like conflicts, argument online it's a very loud voice over there very loud sometimes make you feel anxious so whenever people open their social media some people just delete their social media but think about why they happened because those people who are talented or good at communicating are actually not with a good will right or not in some way they want to manipulate and monetize or things like that i would say if you have something to say if you believe what you say truly are take it's, it's really focused on moving humanity to the next stage. If not, it would be like creating a better environment, harmonious mm -hmm. environment for people to get more peace. If you believe so, you should be out there. Yeah. And so get what's, your, voice. what's your next event? My next event would be 2050. You know, this 2050 is helped by, uh, it's initiated by C Alibaba CTO and oh. the founder of AliCloud from, mm. um, from China, he mm -hmm. initiated this 2050 to bring 20,000 young um, millennial leaders from lower, globally around the world, and uh, bring they have 100 stages. Each stage is like a forum. So um, I become I was selected to be one of the 100 producers. So which is like uh, in two days, each half day have 25 stages running simultaneously with the light or the sound or with like like a stage you can do everything you want to share your belief and values and i invited us three 30 under 30 one forbes under 30 30 under 30 and uh, one from uh, alibaba one of the vp from alibaba and one guy a scholar from Peking university who and also the young author the author, American author of Young China. So we are going to have a forum discuss about how we can make um, Chinese young millennials uh, to share their cross-cultural leadership and tell better Chinese stories to engage with the world. Chinese young millennials. Sure. Because our audience mainly there are Chinese, but mm. I would say that uh, with international audience participating, we are also helping this, the PR, the media team from this organization, um, a influence is helping them to really to gain more international influence. So in some way we are helping them. This is quite a unique event. The reason why- This event why, is in Chinese. Uh, it's, I would say the website is in Chinese, by the way. Okay. So, and I will send you some details if you're interested in, in, in this. And it's quite interesting to me. Yeah, I, don't have... read, I don't read Chinese. Oh, okay. They have English. They have English. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I can share with you, they are producing the English uh, materials and introductions. Once ready, I can share on the social media and mm -hmm. you can take a look at what is that. And this all in Hangzhou next month in May. So mm -hmm. two days like carnival for you. In May. Yes. Next year. This year? This year, next month. And you're, you're going, right? I'm flying back, yeah. You're flying back, okay. Yes, to, to for this event, uh, not just for this event. Also see my baby niece who was born three days ago and mm -hmm. by my sister. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you, and you mentioned you have, a, you have a group of interns that are gonna be doing some social media projects with you? Yeah, yeah, and I have a group of interns in China, most mainly responsible for hosting my event. I have some meetup in when I'm in China, in mm. one in Haikou, another in Shenzhen, and Shanghai. So mm. I'll do at least three kind of meetup. Or mm. in Shanghai, I haven't really haven't really decided yet. I probably will give a lecture at uh, Holt International Business School, since mm. we have a relationship already. Um, that's the events I'll be mostly delivering uh, next month. Yes. Mm. Well, like I said, if you want to promote 
your event in Shanghai, I have a meetup group that now has 7,400 members in Shanghai. Wow, that'd be great. I'd love to, you know, engage with them. Um, you know, maybe, maybe when, when the event's ready, I can share with you. We well, can just, just join the meetup group. It's called oh, really? Shanghai International Meetup. Oh, okay. Send, oh. Me a, send me a private message and, yeah. I can make, and I can make you an event organizer. So you can actually oh. use it. So you can actually use that group to promote your event. That's cool. You're so powerful and so happy for you. <laughs> <laughs> You're really good at this, I have to yeah. say. No, I'm, and, and uh, I'll also send you the link uh -huh. for this. All of this is being recorded. It's going to be stored to the cloud. Uh, okay. So your interns get all the raw footage. Yes. Okay. The video file and the audio file. So you can crop it up, clip it, cut it. If you don't like what you said, you can do Thank whatever you want with it. Thank you so when much. I post it on iTunes, uh -huh. it's live. So oh, yeah. there's no retakes for me. Yeah. So <laughs> will you be able to add it a little bit? For, because at the beginning, we kind of have to, you know, say some more. Just cut that part out. I'm not allowed to do that. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I'm so, actually, I'm taking this course called Broadcast Yourself. Oh, uh, I didn't know allowed, about that part. We're not allowed to do post-production. Okay, okay. Because one of the rules of becoming a broadcaster, especially mm -hmm. if you don't have a large budget, mm. is you don't want to get bogged down with technical stuff. I see. I they see. don't even care if the audio quality is poor, you know, no, they're basically the rule is no retakes, no post-production. You just have to put it, you can crop the beginning, crop the end. Hmm. Uh, but other than that, it just has to go straight up to iTunes. Okay, sure, sure. Absolutely. Please send me a link when it's ready. I'm happy to, you know, to collaborate more on this particular topic. Yeah, I mean, so I know you got a trip coming up in May, but, you mm -hmm. know, when, when all of, when this, when this podcast goes out, and then even when I do the behind the scenes with the YouTube, when, mm. when it all goes out, you'll be tagged in everything. So you can okay. look at it. Um, I'm going to email you the, the link with the raw footage so you can sure. do whatever you want to with it. Sure. Thank you so much. And then, no, thank you for being my guest. You are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm and, sure we have great uh, things happening. <laughs> and then, well, you know, I know you're really busy. So uh, just, um, you know, when you get your team here going and your team mm -hmm. in China going and and maybe someday you'll interview me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We are actually, you know, I'm a love if you have more articles, feel free to share the group, the influencer group, and also you know, share with me. I can help okay. you, you can help, I can help spread the words. And of course, I really love, I enjoy reading your articles and uh, your, your posts, your videos. So anytime mm -hmm. send to us and send to me first and I will send to my interns. Okay, that sounds great. So. Absolutely. Thank you. We've spent about an hour and 20 minutes, which is oh, wow. perfect. I got to get ready for Josh. Okay. He's coming in about an hour. And oh, wow. He's coming live, so I have to, I have studio lights here. So this is like three-point lighting. Oh, wow. I, have, I, I wish studio. I could be in your studio anyway. <laughs> so I, have, I need to take all of this and, and go downstairs and see how I'm going to set this okay. up. Okay. We'll be there one day. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.